Christ. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. The Bible reads, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the Bible says that they and certain other women, Luke 24 verse 1, were with them. And they came to the tomb bringing spices that they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And then they went in and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid, they bowed their faces to the earth, and they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful man and be crucified and the third day rise again. Verse 8. And they remembered his words. And they remembered his words. I want to talk this morning. It's Easter Resurrection Sunday morning 2020. And I want to talk to you about Jesus the Christ, our only hope. Christ, our only hope. Resurrection power for pandemic times. Resurrection power for pandemic times. It's Resurrection Sunday, and many of you all know Resurrection Easter Sunday is still indeed the most historic and triumphant day for the Christian believer all around the world. For over 2,000 years now, Easter, or what we call Resurrection Sunday, has been widely known and considered around the world to be the greatest, most celebrated, historic time indeed it is the day that jesus the christ rose from the dead however please hear me closely however this resurrection easter sunday things are considerably different things are considerably different who would have thought and realized that the entire world is in shut down mode stay at home mode businesses corporations travel sports industries, restaurants, you name it, everything has come to a screeching halt. The death toll as of lately, now 20 million, or excuse me, 20,000 in our country alone. 20,000 in our country alone. 20 million men and women now are unemployed, all within the last three to four weeks. There's financial fear, financial despair, and financial uncertainty. Sickness, disease, death, and darkness. Fortunately, has, unfortunately, has been the mainstay these past few days. COVID-19 has proven to be a force that has to be reckoned with. But I'm reminded today in Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Listen to what the psalmist says. Though we will not fear, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and it doesn't seem like the earth is going through all type of cataclysmic changes. Although the waters roar and are troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, a holy place for the tabernacle of the Most High. God is yet in the midst of the church. And today it is something that God is in the midst of church in your home. Not just here in the four walls of the sanctuary, but God is in the midst of the church that is in the home where he shall not be moved. God is her help, and God is her help just at the break of day. Just at the break of day. I know it seems miserable. You're inconvenienced. Things are, walls seem like they're caving in. And, but God is yet in the midst of all of these situations. All of the circumstances, even in this pandemic. You know, the psalmist wrote and penned, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth living because he lives. And so today, I want to encourage every one of you to realize that Jesus lives God is yet on the throne. Nothing catches God by surprise. Nothing catches God off guard. Because he lives, this is no time just to play it safe and ride it out. But this is a time to reflect, rethink, and again, reset. Because he lives, this is a time to rethink priorities, perspectives, and purposes. Uh, you can do one or two things while you stay at home. 
Many of you all are working and tutoring your children and trying to juggle and multitask. But truth to be told, you could spend hours movie binging with Netflix. You could spend hours playing video games. Or you could take this time and rethink what really matters most in your life. In fact, I encourage you, pick up a hobby in this season. Pick up a trade in this season. Go online. There's, everything is on YouTube. Everything is on the Internet. Learn a new skill. Learn a new trade. Learn day trading. Learn something about real estate. Learn something about tomorrow or commodity. This is a time to really rethink those things that matter most. I think when I think about the things that matter most, it's not financial, it's not real estate, it's not a ministry opportunity around the country, but it's right there in the home. Could this be the time that God ordained for you to be closer to your family? A time to reestablish an altar in your home, seeking salvation and spiritual growth for family, close loved ones, and friends. Again, this is harvest time. This is harvest time. You've heard the word over and over and over that these are unprecedented times. These are unmatched moments. These, yes, are uncharted courses. But I want to take a few minutes today and I want to show you something in the word of God. In fact, we're going to go probably about 8,000 years in about 12 minutes, okay? I want to show you this overarching plan that God has established. This, this continuum, this, this ongoing cyclical, it seems as if nothing new is under the sun. There's a very unique parallel from the Passover in the Old Testament, from the, 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 the arrest, betrayal, and trial of Jesus in the New Testament and this COVID-19 stay-at-home global shutdown today. I want to show you that there is a very unique parallel to all three eras. The Old Testament with the Passover, Exodus 12, Luke 22, as we've just read, with, with some of the events of Jesus' life. And then 2000, fast forward, today during this time. Uh, uh, let, let's start with the Old Testament. From Exodus chapter 7 to Exodus 11, God is trying to get Egypt's attention. He goes to Pharaoh and says, Pharaoh, I want you to let my children go. Moses, you go to Pharaoh and you tell Pharaoh that God said that I am that I am said, let my people go. And, and, and so you, you know about the plague of the frogs and the plague of the locusts and the plagues of all of the different things that God sent to deal with Egypt. But then chapter 12, God says, now I'm going to send the plague of death, right? So you remember in Exodus chapter 12, where God says, children of Israel, here's what you do. I want you to get a lamb, and not just any ordinary lamb, but get a perfect lamb. Get a lamb that is without spot or blemish. Take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost of your dwelling place. I want you to go inside that dwelling place, shut down, stay at home, lock the door. Don't go anywhere because I'm going to pass through the land with judgment. I'm going to pass through the land and deal with situations in that day and time. Now, realize this. In Exodus chapter 12, there was a plague of the frogs, the lice, the flies, the boils, the hails, the locusts, and all of that stuff. Then we get to Exodus chapter 12 in particular, and now there is the plague of disease and death. It's also a time that God gave instructions, again, to the children of Israel. Once again, get the lamb, a sacrificial lamb. Uh, I believe that if the truth be told, Israel dealt then, and we're talking thousands and thousands, thousands of years ago. Israel dealt then with pain. They dealt with uncertainty. They dealt with the unknown. They dealt with disaster. They dealt with darkness. They dealt with disease. And they were at home that night. The word Passover and our Jewish friends are yet celebrating in this week Passover. It is known as the celebration of Israel's deliverance from Egypt and a time of reminding Israel what God had done. Again, for those of you that are just joining us, I'm giving you a very unique parallel because there's really nothing new under the sun. The God who is today was, is, and yet is to come. Okay? Jesus Christ, same yesterday, today, and forevermore. There is this ongoing continuum, almost as if there's this overarching plan that God has. 
So we see it in the Old Testament. We're going to look now in the New Testament, and then we'll close and look at what's happening today. And so we see the Old Testament and the Passover. So they were at home. They had a global shutdown. They had to lock the doors and not travel. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds familiar. What about the New Testament? The Bible says when the hour had come, he sat down with the 12 apostles, Luke 22, 14. And he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And Jesus looks at the 12 and he says, listen, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup, gave thanks and said this, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. And I will not drink or eat or, 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 or until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. So here we have in the New Testament, and I just want to probably suggest we're probably talking about six, maybe 5,000 years after the Passover in Exodus chapter 12, here we now see Jesus. He's having this, this holy week, right? He's in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Why he's celebrating the Passover? He says all things become brand new. That old covenant didn't work. I am the new covenant, and it'll be through my blood. And when you drink of this wine and you break up this body, you will do this in remembrance of me. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And so we see Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper shortly before his betrayal, before his arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion. During those days, just like the Old Testament, there was pain. There was pressure. There were problems. And there were pandemics. Think about it. We won't be the first ones in Easter to be at home. For those disciples were in the upper room. They were at home. It wasn't popular for those disciples to celebrate Jesus in that day and time out in the public streets. Remember now, this Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, he is on trial for his life. And anybody associated with him was in grave danger. And so they celebrated Easter. Where? Just like you. At home. I believe that there was pain and pressures and problems of the pandemic of their day and time. Easter in their homes for the older church was a time of fear, uncertainty, and unknown. Once again, drawing a parallel here. So the Old Testament, so the New Testament. Unknown, uncertainty, fear, pandemic, pain, and pressure. Exodus 12, they are in their homes. These disciples, after the trial, betrayal, crucifixion of Jesus, they are all hiding somewhere in their homes. In fact, the scriptures say that Jesus enters one of those homes after he resurrects from the dead. Remember the scriptures, right? So there's really nothing new under the sun. Let's fast forward another 2,000 years. Here we are, March, April 2020. Uncertainty, fear, unknown, pandemic, death, darkness, disease. And where are we right now? We're in our homes. I think God is speaking to the church. I believe God is speaking to our country, and I believe God is speaking to our world. There's a very unique parallel and a constant continuum of God's perfect will and perfect plan for your life. Once again, Revelations chapter 11, verse 17. We give thanks to you, O God Almighty, for you are the one who is, who was, and is to come. He is the one who is, who was, and is to come. So what we see happening today in the earth is what happened during Jesus' day 2,000 years ago. And what we saw in the New Testament in Luke chapter 22 happening in Jesus' day 2,000 years ago was only because they were commemorating what took place Exodus 12 four or 5,000 years ago. Who would have thought the age then, the age prior, and the age now is a constant continuum, a unique parallel. The Bible says it about Jesus in Hebrews. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Now, I want you to listen very closely to this statement. In fact, I'm going to go back to this camera. And I want to say something very poignant, very pointed, very purposeful. And I need you to hear me real closely. The same God who delivered Israel with the Passover thousands of years ago is the same God who rose Jesus from the dead 2,000 years ago. The same God who rose Jesus from the dead 2,000 years ago is the same God that can raise you from death 
from despair and from distraction and give you hope and give you a, a hope and give you a future in Jesus Christ. You need to know that. There's nothing new under the sun. Oh, I'm so worried. How are we going to get these bills paid? How you been getting the bills paid? Oh, I'm so worried. I'm not sure if we're going to survive. How you been surviving? This ain't nothing new to us, particularly as black folk. We've been going through stuff for 430 years in this country. We've gone through all type of Jim Crow laws and slavery issues and been bitten by dogs and thrown wa water hoses on and lynched from trees. And this is nothing new for us as a people. Why? Because God gives us the grace and great is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I say, and I don't say this to be insensitive to those who lost loved ones and family members and unfortunately, we're praying, by the way, for those loved ones and family members that God will comfort, particularly those who have lost close loved ones and friends in this COVID-19 season. But this is nothing new. And I know people want to be very nationalistic and people want to be very patronistic with a country. But God is judging our country. God is dealing with America, the largest of backslidden countries. But for the saints of the Most High, you may watch with your own eyes. A thousand fall at thy side, 10,000 at thy right hand. But Psalm 91 gives us a promise that this danger won't come nigh you. May I encourage every one of you today, the same God who delivered the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 12, the same God who rose Jesus from the dead in Luke 22, the same God will raise you too from this COVID-19 season. You will recover all. You will abound. You will increase. You will go on to be what God has called you to be. Now, why is this important? Simply because of this. Our hope, our faith, our confidence, and our future is in Jesus Christ. The gospel is established and affirmed on Jesus and Jesus alone. Our hope can't be in our stock market. Our hope can't be in the White House. Our hope can't be in the halls of Congress. Our hope can't be in our own uh, feelings, in our own space. My brothers and sisters today, for those that are listening, and I want you to turn the volume up real loud. In fact, I want you to repeat after me. Why don't we just act like we're right here in the sanctuary? Come on, repeat after me that my hope, my hope is in Jesus. My hope is in Jesus. Our hope. We are a country established on the gospel and on the kingdom and on the foundations of the Holy Bible. We are a Judeo-Christian, not just religion, not just an influence, but we are a Judeo-Christian relationship that was founded on Jesus the Christ. Not Jesus the humanitarian, not Jesus the, 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 the scholar or the rabbi. But Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. When you think about those fundamental, foundational, non-negotiable truths, let me share with you right now that Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose from the dead. Once again, Pastor Stephen, do you ever get tired of saying those four points? Never. Does it ever get old? Never. Does it ever become rudiment or, or ongoing or tireless? Never. Because this is the gospel, the good news of whereby we're saved, whereby we're called, whereby we have a hope, and whereby we have a future. And I want to talk to you these last few moments about the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number one, Jesus lived. You need to know, and I'm preaching today as if there are those listening that have never heard the gospel. Used to be a time, particularly in the black community, you heard the word. Now, you may not have lived the word. You may not have re re obeyed the word. Everybody went to church. Everybody went to Sunday school. Everybody went to vacation Bible school. But now we live in a generation where there are folk in our own community who've never set foot in the doors of a church. Never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's what they hear. They hear all of the slander and all of the games and all of the foolishness and all of the trash that unfortunately our sin and, and fleshly lifestyles have produced. Consequently, they don't hear the pure, unadulterated, sharp word of God that can save their soul and redeem them from corruption. Jesus lived, the Bible says, John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen the glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace, full of truth. 
John 1, 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 1 Peter 1, 18, the Bible says, For we are redeemed not by corruptible things as silver and gold, but we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish, a lamb without defect. Jesus lived. Yes, he lived. 33 and a half years he from Galilee region comes down to Jerusalem he comes throughout the area of Israel he ministers he laughs he walks he talks he weeps he cried he 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 he, he prayed he lived number two he died for our sins Bible says Romans 5 and 8 but God demonstrates his own love towards us while we were yet sinners Christ died he didn't just go into a comatose state he didn't just fall asleep for a couple of hours. He died for our sins. Now, here's what I want you to know today about the death of Christ, the crucifixion. And I know you've seen the movies. You may have done a little internet search, but the truth of the matter is the crucifixion was one of Rome's or the Roman Empire's worst way to kill a man. It wasn't just lethal injection. It wasn't just something in the corner to put him to sleep. It was a public spectacle where he hung on that cross naked. He hung on the cross for you and for me. The cross of Christ was not just on a mountainside or a hillside as all of the pictures show. It was on a main road. It was on a heavy traffic road so all people could see on this main thoroughfare the high traffic of people coming and going into Jerusalem. I know the painters and the sculptures and I know all of the beautiful European looks that it was way on a hill, way out in the somewhere distant. No, 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 no. That cross was on a main thoroughfare. If it was in Charlotte, it had been at the corner of Trade and Tryon. If it had been in New York, it had been right there on Fifth Avenue or right there in Times Square. If it had been in Los Angeles, it had been simply right there on the 405 where everybody could see why because Rome wanted to use it as a tool of torture a tool of attention a tool of death it was a perfect blend of death vengeance and spectacle and this is what Rome intended they didn't just want to kill a man but they wanted to kill the spirit of a nation the crucifixion Jesus lived and he died. Bible reminds us in Ephesians 2.13, when you were dead to your sins, God made you alive with Christ. For he forgave us of all of our sins, and he has canceled the written code with his regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away by nailing it to the cross. He nailed both those hands to the cross. He nailed that, both that, those feet to the cross. There was a spear in his side. One of the nails was for the shame and the guilt that you and I would experience when we've sinned and have hard times forgiving ourselves. Another nail was put in another hand that deals with all of the accusations and all of the verbal abuses and all of the things we'd have to hear. That nail in the foot reminds me today that he, he took the nail in the feet or in the ankles so that you and I could have freedom to walk and be who God's called us to be. They put a crown of thorns on his head because it was mockery, it's something that was more sarcastic when they put the, the label ahead of them king of the Jews they thought that they were simply mocking him and being sarcastic but what they didn't realize was every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess whether your motives were right or not that Jesus Christ is king and he's Lord so he lived he died he was buried he he he, he was buried I don't want to talk to you about the burial of Jesus. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism unto death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Oh, even so we shall walk in newness of life. Joseph of Arimathea. I want you to come to Israel with me one day. I've been to Israel some 22, 23 times. And one of my favorite spot, spots of visiting Israel is going to the garden where Joseph of Arimathea had a nice garden. And in that garden, there's a tomb. And in that tomb, and it wasn't the type of tomb that went down into the ground, but it was a tomb cued out of the side of a mountain where easily a track would have been, where a stone could easily be moved one way or the other. I don't know who Joseph of Arimathea was saving that tomb for, but the Bible makes it clear no one had ever been buried in that tomb. I'm not sure what was going through the mind of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a very rich man. By the way, Joseph of Arimathea was a ruling council, a Jew, but he was a believer. He was a secret 
feared believer. He loved Jesus, but he wasn't quite convinced to be public with his confession. But when the day came and everyone left Jesus on that cross and died painfully and shamefully, Joseph goes to the council and says, may I have that body? I have a tomb that I can put him in. So he was buried. But on the third day, and I'm almost finished, on the third day, he rose from the dead. I love the way Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 15, 15. For we have testified about God that he raised Jesus from the dead. I know that there are those who suspect that perhaps someone stole the body in the middle of the night. Think about it like this. Someone suggested maybe the disciples got together and wouldn't get them. Do you not realize the Roman oppression and the Roman judgment and the Roman rule of that day and time. If anybody would have ever thought of such a thing, they would have themselves been crucified or beheaded or some type of public execution. So no one in their right mind would have done anything to jeopardize their lives. But here's what took place. I believe that those three nights between the death and the resurrection, Jesus goes and he goes to the straight to the very pit of hell and he snatches back, according to 1 Corinthians 15, the keys of death and the keys of the grave and keys of hell. I believe that he has an altar call right then and there for everybody in hell to give them an opportunity to say yes. I wasn't there when you walked on the earth. I was here during the days of Moses or Abraham or one of the prophets or I was here in the, in the early days before you came on the scene. But every knee shall bow before heaven, during heaven, and under heaven, during this time, before this time, and after this time. Every tongue shall confess. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Stephen, I got a logistical problem with that. If they're already in hell, how is it they can get saved? Well, let me help you with the Bible, my friend. Hell is not the final destination for the sinner. The final destination for the sinner is a place called the lake of fire. Hell is a holding pattern. Hell is a place of darkness, yes, a place where uh, there is no flesh, yes, but it's not the final place. Because the Bible tells us that hell shall be cast into the lake of fire after the judgment. Uh, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, let me talk to you and let me just uh, test your intelligence in scripture. Not only is hell not the final destination, but the lake of fire is uh, the place called paradise. Remember Jesus on the cross. The man says, hey, I believe that you are the son of God. And if you would, can I go with you to paradise? Jesus says, yes, you will be with me in paradise. But paradise is not the final destination for the saints. Remember Abraham's bosom? Paradise is equates to Abraham's bosom. It is a place where people die and go to who were right with God. But it's not the final destination because it is after the judgment. It is after uh, the lamb and the goat in that great judgment day where there's a separation of the lamb from the goat, from the saint of the sinner. Then we talk about a new Jerusalem. Then we talk about a new earth and a new, a, a, new, a new heaven. And at that time, my dear friends, you'll be in a place where there's no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain. And all of eternity, you'll be with Jesus. And so going back to this scripture in particular, he wasn't stolen his body. He, no one came and, and, and took him hostage. No, no. He died. He was buried. And he rose on the third day. Now, real quick, why is the resurrection important? Let me give you a couple of things to think about. The resurrection is important today because it is the central fact for you and I as Christian believers. On this day, the church was built and the church triumphantly marches onward because of the resurrection. God's mighty power is at work destroying Satan's plans, Satan's sicknesses, and Satan's and sin that comes from the devil. Why is the resurrection important? Because it is God's mighty power at work. Number three, why is the resurrection important today? Because of the resurrection, death and the grave has been conquered. Why is the resurrection important? Because the resurrection helps us find meaning even in great tragedy. The resurrection helps us find meaning no matter what happens to us as we walk with the Lord. The resurrection gives us a hope and the resurrection gives us a future. It is God's power at work creating new lives, preparing us for Jesus second coming. Now, I haven't done this in a long time. And I'm, firm in, I'm a firm believer that when you got the right thing, you ain't got to doubt nobody else. But I couldn't help but think that the, the distinction of the resurrection from what they call the four or five world major religions. Understand this, in our world today, there are millions of people who adhere 
to different doctrinal belief systems, ideologies, and all type of ethical code. In Hindu, they acknowledge multitudes of gods and goddesses. Buddhists, they say that there really is no deity, although Buddha himself never claimed to be a god himself. Muslims, well, they believe in Allah. He's a powerful but a knowable God. And it was through the prophet Muhammad that 72 virgins were promised to those on the earth. I don't believe that. I don't subscribe to that. There's this new age spirituality. Followers who believe that they themselves are God. They've got a higher consciousness. Well, friends, may I close and remind you of this today. That in Hinduism, a person is their own, trying to seek their own consciousness and from karma. In Buddhism, it is an unindividual quest to be free from desire. In Islam, it is an individual that focuses on religious laws for the sake of paradise after death. For the New Age believer, it is a person working out their own divinity and destiny. But with Jesus Christ, he is the Son of God, the Living One. He is the one who offers a relationship. He is the one who offers himself. He is the one who comes to us. In all of these so-called other religions, man seeks the Lord or man seeks their God. But in Christianity, Jesus sought man. But the Bible says that the Son of Man seeketh to save that which was lost. And so 2 Corinthians 7, 15, 17, 5, 17 reminds me, Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and all things have become brand new. I don't meddle oftentimes like I used to, but let me talk to some of my friends in the nation of Islam. My heart breaks a lot of time for some of the brothers in prison, some of the brothers and sisters on the street. And you subscribe to this atonement man, or this atoning day from Louis Farrell of the Khan. Let me remind you today that there is no salvation in the day of atonement with Farrah Khan. There is no salvation in the nation of Islam. I don't want to meddle too bad, but for some of our Jehovah, Jehovah Witness friends and some of those who are in the Mormon community, in the Mormon church, God bless Joe Smith, but Joe Smith didn't save your soul. Joe Smith didn't die on the cross for your sins. He was a distant traveler coming from the East Coast to the West Coast and created the saints, a church of Latter-day Saints. Let me remind some of you today who say, well, you know what? I'm not a Mormon. I'm not Jehovah Witness. I'm not a 5%. I'm not a Muslim. I'm just doing me. Well, you couldn't die on the cross for your sins. The word God comes from the word self-sufficient one. And until you breathe your own air, until you make your own water, until you provide your own goods, you cannot be a God, big G or little G. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things, my friends, have become brand new. I need you to know today that God loves you with an everlasting love. And I love John 3, 16, very familiar verse. Something that I think has become so familiar, we've lost the power and the muscle and the pull and the push of such a powerful scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His only begotten. And whosoever believes in him. Yeah. He or she shall have eternal life. God did not come to condemn the world. Wasn't well, his goal. People want to know, well, why did God kill everybody with COVID-19? God is not in the business of killing people. Those are decisions and choices that we made when we brought sin into the world through Adam. Adam brought sin into the world with disobedience. Jesus brings healing and, and, and restoration from sin through his obedience to the cross. He's known in the New Testament as the second Adam. So friends, today, yes, God allows COVID-19. I believe God allows things that happen, tragedy, Old Testament, New Testament, and today, and it gets our attention. It causes us to reset and rethink what really matters most. I love football. I love me some sports. I love me some traveling. Oh, I just love seeing my kids grow up. And yes, I want to go to see them graduate from high school and college and get married. And I want to be able to put my grandbabies on my lap. And I love all that this world has to offer. But we're pilgrims passing through. This world, my friends, is not our home. I want to talk to you about salvation right now. Because undoubtedly you have men and women, young boys and girls, cousins and friends, and people are listening. And we made a promise today that if nothing else, they'd have a crystal clarion call to receive the gospel. And I just want to look right into this camera and I want to talk into your home. That if you don't know Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins, if you don't know Jesus now, I'm not talking about just being a church member. That's great, but that doesn't save you. Well, I grew up in the church, and I got baptized when I was 12 years old. That's good and wonderful, but that doesn't save you. 
Well, you know, my daddy was a preacher, my great-grandfather was a bishop, and my great-great-grandmother was a state supervisor. Those are wonderful accolades to have, but that doesn't save you, my friend. What saves you? Well, the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, thou shalt be saved, Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you believe the gospel, what, what's the gospel? Once again, he lived, he died, he was buried, he rose from the dead. Well, Pastor Stevens, I really do believe that in my heart. I wasn't there, didn't see it 2,000 years ago, but I believe in my heart, yes, that Jesus lived, died, buried, rose again. You know what? You become today the perfect candidate for salvation. Now, if you can confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you can make a commitment today to serve the Lord, you may not have thought about going to church two, three, four months ago, but the church has come to you. Not only does it come to you this morning, but it will come to those who will watch this broadcast in the days and weeks and months prior. Hear the word of the Lord today. Hell was never designed for you. Hell was designed for the devil and his angels. Hell was never designed for man. It's not the will of God that you go to hell. The Bible says that hell enlarges itself every day. Every day people go to hell. It was never God's intended will. In fact, the Bible says that he came that man would have life and life more abundantly. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. And he is willing that no man, no man go to hell to have death, but they would have life. I want to pray with you today. And I'm going to make this as simple and as effective as possible. I want to pray a very simple prayer of salvation. But for many of you who say, Pastor, I've, I've never given my life to Jesus, but I want to do it today. We're going to pray that prayer, right? And then there are those who say, I've, I've, I've prayed that prayer, but I've, 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 life has gotten in the way. Some things have happened. I'm not where I need to be. I've backslidden, and I really want to do right. I'm a good man. I'm a good woman. I really want to get it right today, once and for all. We're going to pray a prayer of salvation and a prayer of rededication for you. Let's pray this prayer. I'm going to ask that you bow your heads and close your eyes. Um, saints and Friends of the church, if you've got loved ones who are getting ready to pray this prayer, why don't you just join in with them? We'll pray this prayer out loud together today because I believe with all my heart that God has a purpose and a plan. Remember now, he's the same Old Testament, New Testament. He's the same today. Just as he blessed and delivered Israel then, just as he rose Jesus from the dead 2,000 years ago, today he raises you out of a, out of a pit, a horrible pit, a pit of, of, of sin and of Satan's plans, and he brings you to a place of life and renewal. Heads about eyes are closed. Father, in Jesus' name, I believe in my heart today and I confess with my mouth today that your son, Jesus, he is king of all. He is Lord of all. And I receive the gift of salvation into my life today that I may be a child of God. Forgive me for all of my sins. I'm so sorry. Today I confess, I commit, and I live for you. Fill me with the Holy Spirit that I may do your will and that with joy. For this in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And amen. Friends, the Bible says, again, if any man be in Christ, old things are passed away. Doesn't matter to me what took place last week, last month, last year, 30 years ago. They've been now washed by the blood of Jesus. Your slate has been made clean. And today, you're a brand new Christian. I want you to do something special for me today. I'd like to write you. I'd like to connect with you. I want to make sure that our church is there to help you grow in your walk with the Lord, whether this is your first time committing to Jesus or maybe you're here and you're rededicating or recommitting your life to the Lord, I want you to go to our website, citychurchhuntersville.com, citychurchhuntersville.com. And on that home screen, you should see a button or a tag or something that says, I want to connect. I want to connect. You hit that button, it's going to send you to a little application or send you to a little, a little connect form. It's our e-connect form. We'll just ask us some, some very basic information so that we can send you a text, send you an email, maybe pick up the phone and call. We want to know how can we pray for you, right? Maybe you're here today and you're saying, Pastor Stevens, listen, I'm saved and I love Jesus, and, but I don't have a church home. I don't have a church home. And I, there's nothing more I would love to do than give you the right hand of fellowship right here, but physically we can't. But you can join online and we'll make sure we cover up and or we'll catch up soon and have the official uh, right hand of fellowship service. But until that time, you can go to that same website, citychurchhuntersville.com. 
fill out that connect form and we'll make sure that we follow with you. We want to know all about you. We want, to, want you to know about the church and we want to see us grow and be disciples and grow in the things of the Lord together. I'm so excited about what the Lord has done and what the Lord is doing. I want you to join me on Thursday night. We have our online church at home Thursday night services, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Eastern Standard Time. You can join us Thursday night. There'll be a powerful time of corporate prayer. Then we're going to a very basic but powerful teaching in the Word of God. Next Sunday morning, Lord say the same. Rules are yet the same in our country. We'll be right here. One of the most pleasant things that has surprised me in this season is your giving. Um, you, you know the story. You, you've heard it on the news. I'm sure you've seen it on social media. Churches are, they're, they're, they're in a fix. Churches are in a situation. But I'm yet believing God that all things will work together for the good of this church. In fact, we're communicating to all of our vendors, all of the people we owe monies to, that we're going to come out of this and we believe we can come out bigger, better, and stronger. We'll need some patience. We'll need a plan. But you can be part of that plan. There are four easy ways or four effortless ways to give at the church. And when I talk about giving, we love tips and tax. And we love when people just kind of throw a little something, something at the church, right? But I'm talking about your tithe. Your tithe. Some of you will be tithing through sustainability in this season. Some of you are going to be tithing into a new job to new employment. Some of you are tithing from your business expense and your business increase. My wife and I, we made a commitment that we won't stop tithing in this season. We keep giving to the Lord as we've given through so many other challenging seasons of our lives. Don't you stop now. Don't you let the devil grip your heart with fear. Keep giving, keep believing God and watch him bring you out of all of this, all right? And so you can give through Givelify. You can give on the cash app and the information is right there on the screen. You can also just put in regular mail regular mail, U.S. Postal Service, mail it to the church. The address is here, and we'll get it in the mail, and you'll get a call or uh, uh, an email saying we've acknowledged your gifts in the mail. Fourth, there's the Deacon Drive-By System. I instituted that system. I don't care what other churches are doing. God gave me that vision. We will send a deacon your way, and uh, they'll go in pairs. So either he and his wife or he and another deacon, they'll drive through. They probably won't stop, but they'll slow down long enough to get your tithing off an envelope and bring it to the church. Again, you'll get a receipt. Of, of successful confirmation. I want you to know that we're praying for you. My wife, Pastor Sharon, and I, our leaders, the task force team, you should get a call once a week. You should be touched once a week. You should be ministering and being ministered to once a week. You are a priesthood of all believers. You have been anointed, appointed, and gifted to go minister to your family, friends, and loved ones. Remember, this is a great season for harvest. Redeem the time. Make the most of every opportunity. Know that Jesus loves you, for there's resurrection power in times of pandemic. There's resurrection power in times of pandemic. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as we bring conclusion to this service, as we bring conclusion to this time of your word, we thank you, God, that we shall not fear, for there is a river whose streams may glad the city of God. For you are God in this holy place, the holy tabernacle. Therefore, we shall not fear. Thank you for healing for those that seek healing. Thank you for deliverance and breakthrough for those that are seeking deliverance and breakthrough. Father, thank you for increase, financial favor and blessings on every job, every business, every consulting practice. Father, thank you for favor on the church in your eyes and in the eyes of those that we work with. We pray, oh God, that you would heal the land, save, deliver, and set free. For this in the name of your son Jesus we ask. And we pray, amen and amen. What a joy it's been to be with you on this Resurrection Easter Sunday morning. I want you to be of good cheer for the Lord Jesus overcome the world. And greater is he that's in him than he that is in the world. God bless you. We'll see you soon.